Okay, so uh, now that we have uh, that classroom interaction last time uh, done with, now we can move on to new material, right? And um, so we're going into uh, chapter chapter three in your textbook, which essentially is on the problem of uh, graphing polynomials and um, rational functions. So that's our goal: is to be able to make you know nice, careful graphs of polynomials and rational functions. Now, we've already done some of that already, right? Like one of the problems on your test was sketch the polynomial, and I gave you the already factored form, right? So we're going to think a lot more about that. Um, so that was like 5% of your, the test you just took. It'll be like 50% of the next one, something like that. I don't know. But, um, so let's talk about polynomials and graphing. And so the, um, I just want to recap, there are some basic things we need to know about, right? So given y equals to f of x equals to a n x to the n a 2 x squared plus a 1 x plus a 0. How do we graph? Right? What are what are things we know, and can we know more? Can we learn more? Yes, we can. So um, I would just point out to start with: if the polynomial is very very simple, we already know what to do, right? So simple case, right? Something like y equals x to the n, um, you know, shift around. So for example, if we had y equals to, say, x squared minus 2, you could graph that, right? You wouldn't need to, you know, do anything terribly sophisticated. You go, okay, well, the y-intercept is minus 2, right? And it opens up, so it's, it's this guy, basically, right? So, you know, something like that, there's not a lot of, I mean, you can get that much of a graph without investing a lot of time, right? Now, what if we want to be more careful, right? What could we add detail here if we wanted to? So I, I told you the y-intercept was minus 2, right? How about x-intercepts? Where do we where do we have x-intercepts for this one? Yeah, x squared minus two equals to zero for x-intercepts, right? So that gives us x squared equals, you know, um, so we could write it this way: x squared x minus root two, x plus root two equals to zero. So you see that those are at minus the square root of 2 and the square root of 2. So those are my x-intercepts, right? So that's one of the things I might want to add to make the polynomial graph better, right? X-intercepts and y-intercepts. If I got x-intercepts and I got y-intercepts, that's, that's pretty good. That's something, right? Um, another example, if I had, say, y equals to... Um, x minus 2 cubed, right? I could graph that by thinking about doing what? Basically, I, I think in my mind's eye, okay, the cube is, you know, that, that thing. And if this is what? This is shift right to, right? So, and what's the, um, what's the y-intercept? For this one, I mean, it, it crosses two, right? I never can draw these quite like I want them, but I. I come on. Yeah. 
So can you tell me what this y-intercept is and criticize that my graph is definitely not right? <laughs> Negative 8, right? So let's try this again. <laughs> 1. So it's like down here, right? Ah, good grief. So as you can see, I have um, given my scale, probably made it a little bit too. Now, I can only do so good on the chalkboard because I, I don't have, you know, graph paper. On your test, if I say graph carefully, what do you have to work with? Yeah, I, I've given you that graph paper right on the, right on the, the, the problem statement, so you can work with that and, and do better, right? All right, so my first point to you is we can do gra a lot of graphs by just moving around x equal, y equals x to the n, shifting up, down, left, right, right, with the transformations we already learned. That's one thing we can do. But moving past that, what do we want to find? We want to find x-intercepts and y-intercepts, right? So how do you find x-intercepts? Say that again. Set x equal to 0. Um, well, actually, we set y equal to 0, right? Yeah. X-intercepts come from the solution f of x equals to 0. Whatever's the solution to that, that's your x-intercepts for the function, all right? So if f of x is equal to like some constant a times x minus r1, x minus r2, Da, 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 x minus r, say, s, right? And those could even be the powers, like m1, m2, ms. Numbers. So just think about, you could think about this general pattern. If you could put your polynomial into this general pattern, the product of these factors raised to those powers, right? If you set that equal to zero, the x-intercepts are just r1, r2, r3, da da da, rm, rs. That's my my point to you here. Is um, if that's equal to zero, then we have x-intercepts r1, r2, rs. You know. So that's kind of a general strategy. If we can completely factor the polynomial then we can read from the factors the roots. Or also people, sometimes people say a root, root you could think of as synonymous to zero, okay? So I think your book tends to use the term zero. Um, a lot of people use the term root, all right? For example, your book talks about the rational zeros theorem. I've only ever got, heard it called the rational roots theorem anywhere else, except for your book. But anyway. So x-intercepts are the roots, those are the zeros of the polynomial. And how about the y-intercept? We just do what? Now we set x equal to 0. f of 0 is the y-intercept. That's how you guys figured out minus 8. Right? You thought about this being f of x, essentially, and you calculated f of 0 was minus 2 cubed, which is minus 8. All right? Let's look at an example with a little bit more, um, a little more to it. Suppose we have y equals to f of x, where f of x is the polynomial um, x minus uh, 2 squared times x plus 3 um, times x squared plus 4x plus 5. We want to graph this thing. All right? Now, fortunately, it's already come to you factored, right? Most of the difficulty in this chapter 
comes from the case that you're not given the polynomial factored and you have to factor it. All right, so we're, we're talking more about that as we go on, but this one's nice, it's already factored. And what, so these are the factors, what are the zeros? Um, x equals to 2, minus 3, and wait a minute, what about this guy? Not 5, no. See, this one, if we complete the square, we get x plus 2 squared plus 1. That's x plus 2 squared plus 1. So it cannot be factored. That's a prime or an irreducible quadratic. Okay? So the, the truth of the matter is, this story I told you over here, it's pretty general, but it's missing a piece, right? The other thing that can happen as we factor polynomials over the real numbers is sometimes we get things like this, right? So if, you're, if, you're, if your polynomial is a product of irreducible quadratics, fact, for quadratics which cannot be factored with real numbers, then it could be that there's no zeros. I mean, if it's just a product of those kind of quadratics, there are no zeros because the zeros are complex. So th this one is kind of boring in the sense it doesn't tell us anything about where the x-intercepts are. It's a bystander. The x-intercepts are where? Yeah, 2 and negative 3. So sometimes, and so sometimes we've got to give up on using the same scale for the x and the y-axis, right? Um, I'm not sure what happens here. So there's, there's the x-intercepts. There's one at minus 3, and then one at 2. How about my y, y-intercept? What is it? How do I figure out the y-intercept for this one? Yeah, I, I, right. I put, you mean put 0 for x? I think that's what you mean, right? If we put x equal to 0, we get what? Minus 2 squared times 3, and then the 5 that one of you guys told me about there, right? And what's that? 60, right? So I'm going to give up on using the same scale in the x and the y, right? But um, maybe, maybe this is 30, maybe this is 60, I guess. I don't know. Maybe this is 120. Here's 60. I'll put 60 right here for the sake of discussion. So that's a point on the graph. Now what do I do? So, you know, there's a theorem or a general principle, whatever you want to call it, observation. And simply this, if we have x minus r to like even, it bounces. If we have x minus r to odd, it crosses. I would write that out in more, uh, in more, <laughs> more precisely, but I only have this much board space. I, I, words are at a premium for me. But what I'm trying to say is, if we look at the polynomial, if there is a factor in the polynomial, if it contains the factor x minus r to a power, if that's an even power, then that means that the, the, it has an x-intercept at r, and it's going to bounce off r. On the other hand, if the factor x minus r is to an odd power, then it's going to cross. So in particular for this example, it's going to bounce at 2, because 2 has got an even power here, and it's going to cross minus 3. Um, and we also know that's a point, right? So we already kind of know what has to happen. It has to look like. And uh, I, I don't really know where the, uh, <clears throat> I don't know where the maximum is, you know? But I do know that it has to bounce like that. So there you go, that's a, about as good as I can do. I mean, it's a pretty good picture in the sense that it at least has the x-intercepts and it has the y-intercept label, labeled, right? That's starting to be good. What's bad about this? Like, what's, what's imprecise about this is that I don't know actually where this function has a maximum in here, right? I've drawn it like it's at 60, but for all I know, this graph could actually look like this. You know, I, I don't know. Like that's a totally, other, a totally reasonable other other interpretation of the of the function. Like it could be that the maximum's to the left over here, right? 
could be that the maximum's over there. I would not know without plugging in further points, right? If I evaluated the function, you know, at say minus one, and if I evaluated the function at one, then I could improve my picture, right? I could maybe see that it's going up or down to the left or to the right of the y-intercept. I'm not going to do that, <clears throat> but we could, right? So is it always the case that we, we were kind of not able to add that kind of detail? Like there's a special case, there's a special kind of polynomial where we completely own the graph, right? What is that case? Well, there's two cases. The first one we covered earlier on, lines, right? A linear function is a first order polynomial. <clears throat> Right? When the degree is 1, it's a line, you get the slope, you get the y-intercept, you graph it. Right? There is no max min, it just goes on and on. Or it's constant and everything's a max and everything's a min. Um, <clears throat> but example 4, you might have y equals to f of x equal to x squared plus 6x uh, minus 20, for example. Right? And so to graph this, what I would do is complete the square. Which would give me x plus 3 squared and then minus 9 minus 20 which is minus 29. So once I have that, I know where the vertex is. The vertex is where? And also notice f of x is equal to x plus 3 minus the square root of 29, x plus 3 plus the square root of 29. We can factor this polynomial, right? So completing the square gives me a formula which already has the polynomial as a difference of squares. And then from that, I find the factorization. Or if you've been taught to use the quadratic formula, you could do that and work backwards to find the factorization, right? But anyway, it's important to be able to find the factorization of the polynomial because it does what? This reveals what? The roots, right? The zeros. Minus 3 plus or minus the square root of 29, right? Which is what? 5 point minus 3, like plus or minus about 5.3. So I think these are approximately where minus 8.3, um, 2.3 maybe, roughly speaking. What's the uh, y-intercept? That one's, that's easy, right? What, what is it? negative 20 right there there for the picking and so we have man we have all kinds of things about this we can do a really good job graphing this one we know we know everything you know Let's see if I can do it decently um, Let's see here, so um, so the, um, the y-intercept is minus 20. It's got an x-intercept of um, minus 8.3. It's over here somewhere. It also has an x-intercept of 2.3, which is here somewhere. And where is its vertex? Minus 3, like right here, right? So roughly speaking, something like that. Of course, if I had graph paper, we could do better, but 
I mean, now there's no ambiguity. Not like in my previous example. I don't know where the maximum actually happens here, right? I don't know where it is. It could be 60. It could be left or right of it, right? For the parabola, I know for sure the maximum, well, it doesn't exist, right? I know the minimum, though, is minus 29. It's attained at minus 3. So parabolas are special, OK? So the first problem I asked you in mission 3, 4, 3, 4, mission was it? The mission you're currently working on, um, I think it's mission 4, is that right? 4, OK, 4. I can't count. Um, like the first problem is about quadratics. So if you understand example 4, you should be able to do the first problem in mission 4 pretty easily, OK? Right. That's the thing is, you know, I might, I might, would like to see the, you know, the exact zeros. But yeah, of course, you can use a graphing calculator um, to check your work for sure. And also true over here, right? Um, but there, there are, I, I will warn, uh, graphing calculators are helpful, but you'll see as we go on that they're not going to be helpful on a large swath of what we're doing. They're always, they always could be helpful. Um, in the right hand, but they could also waste a bunch of time if you don't have a clear plan for what you're doing. OK, so next up. I need to talk about long division. So let me remind you. If we had, say, 13, and we were going to divide it into um, 236, right? Can 13 go into 2? No. Does 13 go into 23 once, right? So I write a 1 up here, and that gives me 13, right? I subtract, and I get 2, 0, 6, right? How many times does 13 go to 206? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Have I done this wrong? I feel like I did something wrong here. 106, thank you. That felt really wrong because I was getting something bigger than, I was getting something larger than uh, 10. I'm like, that doesn't seem right at all, right? We should always get numbers between what? 0 and 9 as we're doing this, right? If we're doing it right. Um, so 106. How many times does 13 go into 106? 8 point what? Say again? 8 point 1, which means we keep the 8, right? And what's 8 times 13? It's 104. So then that gives us a 2, right? At this point, once this number is smaller than your divisor, you're done, right? This is how long division works for numbers, right? This is the remainder. And so the reason I do this is I just want to remind you what this calculation means, right? It means that if we take 236 and we divide it by 13, we get what? We get 18 plus 2 over 13. That's what this calculation means to us in terms of fractions proper and improper, right? There's another way you could look at it. It also means what? It means that 236 is equal to 18 times 13 plus 2. This is how mathematicians tend to look at this division algorithm, as it's called. It says you can write any um, integer as the product of like a multiple of the divisor plus a remainder term where the remainder term is smaller than the divisor. So that's just a review. We can do the same thing with polynomials. So if I have like x squared plus 2, and I'm dividing it into x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 7, I can play the same game, right? I can say, well, what do I need to multiply x squared plus 2 by to get x to the fourth? x squared. And so x squared, time, that gives me x to the fourth 
plus 2x squared. Now, the other class fussed at me for not putting in zeros. So if you need to put zeros in here, go for it, all right? But I'm going to be lazy as I can because I don't have so much board space in here. So I subtract, and it gives me what? 3x cubed minus 2x squared minus 7. Now, how do I get 3x cubed from an x squared? Multiply by what? I focus on the leading terms while doing the division, because we have to kind of knock out the leading terms and, and work our way down and, and face the consequences as we work our way down from like the leading terms, which in here are x squared and this time 3x cubed. How about plus 3x? Yeah. So 3x, that gives me 3x cubed plus what? Plus 6x, yeah? And again, we subtract. The leading 3x cubed term goes away. We're left with minus 2x squared minus 6x minus 7. Now you guys tell me, what do I do next? Uh, well, what's that? Uh, no, the negative was fine, but we don't need an x, right? Just, just minus 2. If you already said that, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Um, so that would be minus 2x squared. Minus 2 times 2 is minus 4, right? Again, subtract. The 2x squareds cancel, or the minus 2x squared cancel. And we've got minus 6x, what? Um, well, but notice minus minus, right? So yeah, so minus 7 plus 4, negative 3, right? And so the rules of polynomial long division are you, you do the same algorithm, basically, that we did with numbers, but you stop once the thing that you get has a smaller degree than your divisor. Um, you missed where the, um, the, so to get the 3x, so I got this 3x cubed here from, you know, subtracting that from that. You notice that there's no x cubed here, so it just comes down. So in order to get 3x cubed, I have to ask myself the question, what can I multiply x squared plus 2 by to get a 3x cubed? So the answer is 3x, because and then, of course, it comes with extra strings attached, right? Like when I multiply 3x times this, I also pick up this pesky 6x term. But we can deal with that in the next step. Well, actually, we never kind of deal with it. It kind of just trickles all the way down to the remainder, doesn't it? So, but that's the remainder. What does this mean? So just like we have a fraction here, we also have a fraction. We have the um, x to the fourth. Uh, bu -bu 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 plus 3x cubed minus 7 divided by x squared plus 2 is equal to what? It's equal to x squared plus 3x. Oh, yeah, plus. Uh, you know what? I'm going to pull that minus out just to be lazy because I just I like the way it looks. It's just totally a matter of uh, my own vanity, but... I just, I like to have that minus out front like that, but whatever, there you go. And we could also look at this. This gives us a corresponding result, which is that x to the fourth plus 3x cubed minus 7 is x squared plus 2 times x squared plus 3x minus 2 um, minus, well, 6x minus 3. So long division, polynomial long division, tells us, in a sense, it actually tells us what? It's telling us how to factor out. It actually reveals how to factor out a polynomial from a given polynomial. Notice this basically is, you know, our best attempt 
to factor out, you know, x squared plus 2. So what I'm trying to say is if you want to factor something out of a polynomial, yes, we have previous methods like guess and check, you know, for quadratic completing the square, that's great because it always works. But for a larger polynomial, if you have a suspicion that something factors out, what you can do is take the polynomial and divide by the thing it factors out, that you think factors out. And if it does, it will. It'll show you how it goes. This one, it didn't factor out, right? x squared plus 2 is not a factor, right? x squared plus 2 is not a factor of this quartic. Why? Because when you try to factor it out, you get this pesky remainder term over here, right? Let's do another one. Are you guys, or are you guys totally bored of polynomial long division? You're all like, I already know this. I don't need to review it anymore. See, you guys are more honest than the other class. The other class is like, oh yeah, we got this. Like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that the other section of pre-calculus really, really understands polynomial long division completely carefully. I don't believe it for a second. <laughs> but they're all like, we got this. I'm like, what? It doesn't make sense to me. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> Here. <clears throat> Another example. This time we'll do a linear one. Let's, um, here's the question. Is x minus 2 a factor of x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 10? All right, here we go. So what would I do first? x squared, all right. So that gives me x cubed minus 2x squared, yeah? So we, we get what? We get 5x squared and then minus 8x um, plus 10. Because minus a minus gives me a plus. Remember, division is repeated subtraction. So we've got to be careful when we subtract a negative, take into account. Oh, plus a 5x, all right, great. So I get 5x squared minus 10x. And then we subtract again, what do we get? Two, I heard 2x plus 10, yeah? Oh, plus 2. So that gives us 2x minus 4. Looks like we got a... Yeah, 14, 14. So there you go, that's the remainder. So no, no, it's not a factor, right? But what we can say, so what this tells me then is that um, x cubed plus 3x squared minus 8x plus 10 is equal to, well, it's equal to x minus 2 times x squared 5x plus 2 plus this pesky 14 <laughs> sitting out here by its lonesome. That's what that calculation means. Yeah. But you're right. The question you're going to ask now is how do we use it? <laughs> right? Like, so what? <laughs> Surely you're not just going to ask me to do this like a, a mindless autonomous, like a mindless robot on the next test, right? I mean, I'll find a way to make it worse. It's in my DNA, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I will. Anyway, so there, there's that. So theorem. Um, basically, the theorem says this. f of 2 is equal to 14. Try plugging 2 into this polynomial. We get 8. 
plus uh, 12 minus 16 plus 10, which is equal to 20. That's 20, that's 30, 30 minus 16, 14, right? This is called the remainder theorem. The remainder theorem says, uh -huh, yes, if we divide f of x by x minus r, then the remainder is precisely f of r. So here, the root in question is 2. I mean, the, the number is 2 that we're looking at. We're studying 2. Is 2 a root? Well, you could look at it that way. Is 2 a root? I mean, if, if 2 is a root, if a 2 is a 0 of the, of the polynomial, then f of 2 should be 0. Of course, it's not, right? It happens to be 14. So this is the remainder theorem. The remainder theorem says if you divide a polynomial by a linear factor, then the remainder will be the value of that polynomial at the corresponding 0 to the factor. So the factor is x minus 2. The 0 corresponding to that factor is 2. Factor x minus 2 corresponds to 0 of x equals to 2. Right? This is the interplay. Zeros versus factors. Yeah. Yeah, if I had, had if I had a if I had x plus two there instead, then um, that would be x plus we have to look at x plus two as x minus a minus two. So like that's that's how positive numbers come into the story. We have to view positive numbers as minus a minus number. Ah, well, so what Jared is advocating for is the next theorem, which is that f of r equals to 0 if and only if x minus r is factor of f of x. Now, the context of both of these remainder theorem and the so-called factor theorem is f of x is a polynomial. That is important. That fine print must be attached, talking about polynomials. All right. But yeah, that's, that's the theorem, is if the function evaluates to give you 0, then the corresponding factor is a factor. That's the factor theorem, right? And it's essentially a corollary to the remainder theorem, because it's just the remainder theorem with the remainder, you know, with the f of r being 0. Oh, this is this is just f of two. Where this is f of x. I'm calling that f of x. Plugging in two, 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 two cubed, eight, three times two squared, three times four is twelve. Uh, eight times two is sixteen. So minus sixteen plus. Very good question. I mean, I left a lot unwritten there. That is an example of a very good question. So now that we have this factor theorem and we know long division, what does that mean we can do? How does that help us factor? So suppose we have something like, I don't know. Oh, wait a minute. I got chalk up here already. f of x equal to um, 
x to the fourth um, minus 3x squared plus 2x Factor that. And I'll give us a hint. Try um, calculate f of one. Calculate f of 1. What is f of 1? So we get 1 minus 3 plus 2, which is 0. What does that mean? That means that we can divide x minus 1 out of the polynomial. Now there's two ways we can go about this. We can either do the obvious thing of factoring x out before we start, or we can just divide into the quartic. What do you guys want to do? Do you want to factor the x out first and then work on what's left over, or do you want to just try to divide into the fourth one? Take the x out? All right. So here's the thing, if you start thinking about this, if this is x times x cubed minus 3x plus 2, right? Can it be, think about this, if f of 1 is equal to 0, what also must be 0? What, what, 1 must also make 0 what? This guy, right? Because there's no way that x can be 0 when x is equal to 1. So it stands to reason that this must also have 1 as a 0. And it's easy to check that by the factor theorem again, right? Because 1 minus 3 plus 2 is 0. So we're going to try to divide x cubed minus 3x plus 2 by x minus 1. Let's see what happens. Can you guys? Do it just by, um, just by looking at it. I mean, I don't know. What I'm asking is, before we go through this, can you tell me how to factor out x minus 1? And think about that for a second. Could you just factor x minus 1 out? I can't, right? <laughs> I mean, OK, admittedly, I know a trick that would make it work, but this is easier. x squared, you said. Subtract, what do we get? We get x squared, because minus and minus is a plus, right? Um, the minus and minus being a plus? Or what do you mean, continue? I mean, we, this, this had better work out to a remainder of 0. Otherwise, we've got something wrong, you know? So the remainder should work out to 0. It should not continue forever. Um, it should stop pretty quickly, actually. So this is next is x, right? Plus x. So that gives me x squared um, minus x. Subtract what we get. Negative 2x plus 2, right? So I do minus 2 up here, right? And then that gives me minus 2x plus 2, 0, hooray. That's a good sign. See, because what this long division has shown us is the non-obvious fact, which is that, um, I'm going to write it up here. This is actually x times what? x minus 1 times x squared plus x minus 2.
the thing is, once we get down to quadratic, then we can, we can, then we can, we can use completing the square to knock it into pieces because it always works. Or you could factor it. Maybe you can factor this. I don't know. When I say you can factor it, I mean like black box guess and check factoring. That was given. That was that was given. But as a general point of order, you know, it's a pre-calculus class. People who write textbooks aren't monsters. They typically make answers be whole numbers. So I always try to plug in like one minus one, two, <laughs> see if they work. Um, a more real-world answer to your question is look at the graph, kind of see where it crosses, and maybe go from there. Best guess. Um, the truth of the matter is, for beyond fourth order problems, there is no cut and dried formula. Like we have a formula for finding the x-intercepts for a quadratic, right? There's a similar quadratic form, like something similar to the quadratic formula for cubics. There's also one for quartics. But probably about the last 30 years of, I don't know, there's some very, very powerful mathematicians who tried to find the fifth order analog of that back in like 1770 to 1800 and spent the better part of decades trying to do it, couldn't do it. And then it convinced the rest of the mathematical community it couldn't be done. And this actually gave birth to what's called group theory. Like in the early 19th century, there was a mathematician who essentially proved that for fifth order and higher polynomials, you cannot find an analog of the quadratic formula. And um, this ultimately gave birth to what's called group theory, which nowadays is used in quantum mechanics and everything. But anyway, um, that. Can we factor it, though? We're almost done. Did you guys know a simple check whether or not the the quadratic is reducible? So here's the check: ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to a times x minus r1 times x minus r2 for for real r1 r2, if and only if b squared minus 4ac is greater than or equal to 0. So in other words, if you can check that b squared minus 4ac is negative, it can't be factored. So for that one, what's b? So what's b squared minus 4ac in this context? It is 1 minus 4 times, uh-oh, looks like our job is not done, isn't it? That's 9. That's greater than 0. That means we can factor that. And I would advocate doing it with what? Oh, come on, guys. That, that, one, that, one, that one's easy, isn't it? Very good, yeah. If you had already seen that or convinced me of it, we could have skipped this diatribe, right? But this is a useful discussion to have because when you hit a quadratic and you don't know, you can fall back on this as a check, right? Whether or not you can split it further. Um, and can we, we can do more, right? This is equal to x times, check that out, there's two x minus ones. So that's how I would write my answer. It's said that the quadrat the factor x minus 1 has multiplicity 2. We'll need to talk more about multiplicity when we get back to graphing rational functions and talk about something called holes in the graph and such. But anyway, that's it for here. Listen, Monday, we will not have class in the sense of being here. I will make a video, let you guys watch it. I'll try to talk about like the rational roots theorem and um, Descartes' rule of science, maybe. More on, uh, more on how we can factor polynomials using these kind of tricks. So I won't be here. So sorry about that. And hopefully Wednesday, I'll have your test for you. What's that?